Well, we're getting near to the end of this Sermon on the Mount series. And by the way, thank you. Uh, many of you have uh, just either sent me texts or caught me in the hallway and told me how much you've enjoyed the, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and, and I have too. You know, the Sermon on the Mount is it's, uh, it's, it's hard and it's easy. It, it's, it's hard because it's simple. And, and uh, it's, it's not easy to, to always make some of these things. They're not complex, but they are deep. And, and, and so today we're going to talk in this Called series. The series we've been working on is, is called Called. And, and because we, we believe that, that it, we are called to, a, to higher ground. And so that's what we're going to look at this, this morning. Do we have graphics I'm out there? Uh, are we, there we go. That's, that's the series, called. And so we're going to talk about a certain calling this morning. Um, and I, and I, it made me think as I was putting this together, it, you know, I, I grew up in the South. And, and uh, if, uh, you know, if, if you, not, not many folks are from Franklin, it seems like everybody has, has moved in. And I, I almost feel local being from Tullahoma, you know, and 90 miles away. And a lot of folks, I, I've all, we joke on staff uh, a lot that maybe we should say on camera to all of you listening from California, we're, we're waiting you to be here. Um, because uh, every week uh, we have somebody from California that comes to our church and they're saying, hey, we've been listening for a month. We finally got our house. And I'm telling you, there's no kidding. We've actually kicked around the idea of saying we're going to start a small group for Californians. Uh, so if, if you're feeling prompted, California people, then, um, then uh, come see us at the hub. But it, it, growing up in the South, uh, you're around religion a lot, even if you're not religious. The South d does, it, it especially did, uh, when I was growing up, have religious overtones. It, you'd go to a, a football game and they would have an invocation. You know, you'd go to a baccalaureate, which had religious overtones. You know, you, you grew up knowing, even if you didn't go to church a lot as a kid, you had Sunday clothes. Right, and, and you had your Sunday clothes, and, and I had Sunday clothes, and I remember my great grandfather Herbert Kelly, who uh, lived in Columbia. Uh, he, uh, Pa Kelly, we called him, and Pa Kelly, uh, he had the, the coolest flat top of any human being that ever lived. It was about that high, and you could lay a plate on that thing, man. I mean, it was hard and stiff and beautiful flat top. And he he was a, a man of humble means. He was very gentle, and uh, he uh, was a farmer, and he had. Had two pairs of overalls. He had the overalls he wore all week, and then he had his Sunday overalls with a white shirt, and that's what he wore. And, and so he had Sunday clothes. You had to, you know, your Sunday clothes were, were different, right? And, uh, and then if you grew up in the South, you know, you're, you're used to a, a lunch crowd. You know, if you're going to go, if you're going to try to hit Slotsky's or you're going to try to hit Jason's Deli, even if you don't go to church, well, you got to, you know, get out before the Presbyterians do so that you can get over there and beat them or the Baptists or whatever. And so uh, that's kind of how it works. So our, our culture is, it is in many ways, it's, it's laced with, with religion. And, 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 and you have perceptions within that of who we think Jesus is. We have perceptions of Jesus being, being this mild man, and he was. Jesus was mild. He was gentle. People tend to gravitate to those images of Jesus, that he was tender, that he was a friend of sinners. In fact, all the religious people didn't like Jesus too much because he would actually talk to women. So, so for any, any of you in the workplace, if you ever hear that Christianity uh, it isn't pro-woman, oh, are they wrong? The fact that Jesus even acknowledged that women existed was an incredibly revolutionary standard. The fact that he would let women travel with him, Jesus was the liberator and the, the razor upper, if you want to call it that, of women. Jesus would, in, he, he would invite prostitutes to, to come into his camp and listen. He, he wasn't afraid of sinner people. And it was a breath of fresh air. So Jesus was all of that. And we have in this religious culture, this idea of who Jesus is. But if Jesus is so gentle, and if Jesus is so nice, and if Jesus is, is the best friend, you know, Jesus is often referred to as, even in songs we sing, my best friend. And if that's really true, then the question that I, I have to ask, well, then why did they kill him? Think about that. 
I mean, why would you kill a gentle man? Why would you kill the best friend you could ever have? Why would angry mobs stand out there and yell, crucify him? Why would the religious people constantly be trying to find a way? If you read the New Testament, why, why is it that there's story after story in the New Testament of Jesus having to evade crowds that were seeking to kill him? Why would they try to kill him? That well-known Christian author said it, I think, great, Philip Yancey. He said it this way, how would telling people to be nice to one another get a man crucified? What government would execute Mr. Rogers? It's really true. If Jesus was just gentle, if he was just easygoing, and if he was just your BFF, then why did government seek to put him on a cross? There had to be something going on. So we're going to get to the end of this sermon series, or the Sermon of the, on the Mount. And Jesus is separating what I call the religious from the redeemed. He's separating the religious from the redeemed. And, and it's, it's in Matthew 7. If you've got a Bible, let's go there. It's Matthew 7, verse 24. It, it, we, you just sang about it a little bit, actually, about Christ the solid rock. We're going to talk about this, this ending the way you end a sermon, I can tell you as a, as a pastor, is something that is important. You always think about your conclusion, and so Jesus is doing that now. And if you don't have your Bible, it's on the screen for you. Here we go, Matthew 7, 24. Jesus said, therefore, in other words, in light of everything I just said, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded or built on the rock. But then Jesus switched gears. He does a compare-contrast, ma master teaching move right here. He says, now everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So, so, so what is Jesus getting at here? He's obviously not talking about the fact that we need to go out and build houses. You know, he's talking about the, the structures themselves. And when you read about the two houses, you can look like two houses here. Like, you, you know, you could go through any development in Franklin right now, and you could see homes that look a lot like that. And, and, and you could say, okay, you really can't tell much about the home. They look about the same. They're, 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 obviously, there's different floor plans. They're, they're, they're structurally put in different places, but they, they both look great on the outside. They look the same. And so how do we know? Jesus said, when the pressure comes, you'll know. You'll know. So what is Jesus getting at when he's giving this very famous illustration, building your house on the sand or building your house on the rock? Why is that important? And what in the world is Jesus trying to say right now to us at the end of his sermon? Well, I, I, I believe there's, a, there's a, a few inescapable realities that we, we, we just have to deal with. Whether you want to or not, Jesus is pulling this thing to a close, and he's got some things to say. And, and I, I really do think that one of these inescapable realities is simply this. What, what is he saying by the two rocks and the, building a house on the rock? He's saying that you cannot come to God on your terms. You really need to understand how important it is to know that. Jesus is, is to use a, 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 a cliche, Jesus is drawing a line in the sand. And this isn't so gentle. This isn't so just easy. See, it, it's, it's interesting, the, the, the parts of the life of Christ that we hone in on. We hone in on the parts of Jesus that make us feel good. We hone in on the parts of Jesus that, we, that make us feel better about ourselves. But then you got words like this when Jesus is saying, oh, so if you're in that crowd, and, and by the way, I, I want you to know People in that crowd, 
they were religious people. If this were 2020, Jesus would have been doing a church tour. He's not speaking to all the people that are at Meredith's right now. He's speaking to people under the steeple, familiar with the temple, familiar with the Jewish law. And what he's saying to them is, you you can't come to God on your terms. It's on his terms. He says, if you hear these words of mine and you do them, you are wise. If you don't, you are headed to destruction. And that, friends, isn't gentle. That's just the truth. We live in a day where... It's a very pluralistic society, meaning kind of anything goes. Listen to celebrities talk. Listen to musicians. Listen to artists. Listen to some of your friends say, well, that may be true for you. It's not true for me. But that's just not, that's not, that's, that's, if that's your truth, it's okay. And, and, and I want to say to you that that, that is an easy way to escape a difficult conversation in a sales meeting. But it's just not true. Because I don't get to decide what truth is. I'm not the creator. I have to conform to truth. It doesn't conform to me. And I don't get to make truth up. And, and, and so what's happened in the American culture is now that we, we believe that kind of, you know, all roads lead to heaven and, and, and that's just not true. It's not true at all. Who are the kind of people? I've been asking myself this question all week. Who are the kind of people that would build a house right on top of the ground? I remember one time uh, I was outside with my granddad, and I was a young boy, and he just looked over at the neighbor, and he just kind of started shaking his head, and then I was like, well, what? I said, what? What's going on? And he, and he, he said a bunch of stuff about this neighbor. It, it wasn't like bad stuff, but it, it, it just, I could tell he didn't approve, and he said, that man poured a driveway right on top of the dirt. Now, I, I, I didn't, is that bad? He said, yeah, because it ain't going to last long. I watched him. He poured concrete right on top of the dirt. And I was like, oh, well, you know, my driveway now at the age of 48 or almost 48, my, my driveway is starting to be uneven. And I asked a driveway guy, I said, hey, why is this thing doing this? He said, because back in those days when codes happened, they didn't have to put much of a pad there. The structure is not sound. It's living proof of what happens when you just take the easy way. The easy way. And that's what people do when they build their house on the sand. Why does this matter to me? Because what, what, what happens to us in, our, in the American culture now is the religious elite, and Jesus is separating the religious from the redeemed. Religious people, they want to worship in person, but they just don't worship in soul. They, they want to come to faith as long as it doesn't mess up their lifestyle too much. And so you're going to know the evidences of that, and that's what Jesus is getting at. He's showing evidences of this. This whole chapter is kind of leading toward trees and fruit, and we're going to talk a little more about that in a minute. And, and he's, he's showing evidences of salvation. And so it's, he, notice, the, notice the, the flag that he plants in the ground. If you hear these words of mine and you do them, you're wise. But if you don't, Destruction's what you're going to get. He draws that line. But there are evidences, is what he's saying. There's, there's two contrasts. There's evidences here of salvation. And, and I want to I wanna say to you, that's what we know. We are, we are called. We're called to face reality. And reality is I can't come to God on my terms. I have to have a, a, a person. My entire person has to conform to the life of Christ. I would go so far as even to say the greatest evidence of redemption is a redeemed will. I would tell you that. The greatest evidence of redemption is a redeemed will. Say, what do you mean by that, Jason? This is what I mean. What I mean is you can say you're a believer all day long. I will know it by what you do. I will. And you'll know it in me by what I do. I can say I believe in Jesus in the way I parent. I'll, you know what? You can watch my life and you can tell if I actually believe the words of Christ by how I'm a dad and what I call my sons to live up under. 
You, you know, I can say a lot of things about what I believe about the kingdom of God. You'll know it by what I do with my money. It's an indicator. I can tell you a lot of things about my time and what's most important to me, but all you have to do is just watch my life. And if you watch my life, the greatest evidence of that will be a redeemed will. What do you mean by that, Jason? What I mean is that my will, my heart's desire, my want to, my chief aims, all of that fall under the cross. And that shapes how I do life. It shapes how I parent. It shapes my money. It shapes my career. It shapes who I let into my life as friends. And those are the evidences of what it means to, to build on the, the, the rock. You see, if, if your will, if your attitude, if your desires, if they're not redeemed, if your desires haven't changed, then you need to ask yourself, have you actually changed? Because I want to tell you, you cannot, listen to me, you cannot come to Christ and just be okay with sin. You cannot. It doesn't mean you're not going to sin. You are going to sin. But there is no redeemed person that is comfortable with it. There's no redeemed person that is comfortable just living as a gossip. Tearing people up. If you're redeemed, you, you, you can't abide that. There's no redeemed person that can just roll with it when it comes to sexual sin. You can't abide with it. There's no redeemed person that can just sit back and, you know, come what may in the kingdom of God. No. No. That if you know Jesus, it has affected and permeated every area of your life. Look at what, what it says in 1 John 3. 1 John 3 says, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or has known him. Notice, he didn't say, you're never going to sin. What he's saying is, you're not comfortable there. You're not at home there. You know, I grew up an only child. And I grew up, some of you are going, oh, it's all coming together now. Okay, all right. So I grew up an only child, and I grew up an only grandchild on one side of the family. I had no hope when it came to selfishness, right? Man, I want to tell you, had it not been for my wife, and, you know, there's a lot of times I tell y'all stuff I don't want y'all to tell her. This is one of those things I do want y'all to tell her, okay, when you see her, right? Had it not been for my wife, I... I would be, you, whatever, whatever, whatever limits you put on me right now, however much I might irk you a little bit, I'm telling you, friends, it's way better than it was going to be. All right? No kidding. Because I didn't know how selfish I was till I got married. Because not only was I an only child, not only was I an only grandchild, I had my own apartment in college, and I had my own apartment in seminary, and I didn't have to think about nobody ever, never. So when I got married, I would do things like change the channel. You know, hey, I'm watching that. Oh, really? I mean, I really didn't know if there's such a thing as, you know, uh, pure-hearted selfishness. I had it, whatever. Um, but really, you know, but even, even in my redeemed self, there's times I'm still selfish. But I want to tell you something. I'm not at home with it. It doesn't feel good. When I just think about me, and it is easy to think about me. It's not at home. I'm not at home there. You see, you have a redeemed will, and it's an evidence of salvation. Jesus was talking to people. It wasn't that they were bad people. Actually, they were good people. It, it, it's just that they were more reformed than they were redeemed. And by reformed, I don't mean reformed theology. They were just reformed. They had gotten better, cleaned up, shaped up. Been a little bit better, church going folk, as we would say, but they were the furthest thing from redeemed. And so, what happens over time is as pressure comes, 
And that's what Jesus is getting at. He's saying that you, you can't really understand what's, if a house is going to make it through a storm until the storm comes. See, when pressure, you know, you know how you, I told you that Jesus is separating the religious people from the redeemed people. You know how you know that that's the case? All you got to do is watch. Because religious people, they won't tolerate difficulty long. They just won't. They won't tolerate anything that makes them push, stretch, sacrifice. They just won't do it. They'll just find another church, or they'll just quit going altogether, holding on to their beliefs. And I meet many people like that. But redeemed people, well, their house will stand up under pressure. Their house will stand up under pressure. And so what I think what this story can teach us is, is a really simple truth that storms reveal the strengths of the structure. Storms are the indicator. Storms reveal the strength of the structure. That house, is, is your house going to make it? I don't mean the house with your physical address. I mean your faith system. Is your faith system going to hold up under pressure? Well, you know, you'll know. You'll know. Because all you got to do is put pressure on people and see if they cave. So Jesus is teaching us a lot about being religious versus being redeemed. And there's another inescapable reality, I think, in this whole thing of the two homes and the two foundations. And I, I think Jesus would, would basically break down and, and tell us that eternal life is, is really not based on a position. It's more based on a position than it is a contract, I would say. See, so what, what do you mean by that, Jason? If you look at the greater story in Matthew 7, I want you to notice the flow. If you go back up to verse 13 for a second, Jesus talks about enter through the wide, the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many find it. Then Jesus moves down in verse 15 to verse 22. He talks about trees and fruit. He said, you'll know a tree by the fruit. You'll know, you'll know who they are. Evidences of redemption will be there. And then he gives yet another illustration of a word picture of two homes. One's built on the rock, one is not. And what he's talking about is you're going to know who's redeemed and who's just religious based on the fruit, the path, the foundation of their lives. Eternal life is not a contract with God. Yes, it's based on a promise. I, I didn't say it wasn't. What I'm saying to you is eternal life with Christ is based on a position, meaning that you are outside of Christ and Christ opted to go to the cross for your sins and he went to the cross and he died on the cross and he came out of the grave so that your position before a holy God could change. There was nothing you could do to change your position. It took a holy God in the form of his son taking on the sins of the world just so that you could take on the family name. So you can't earn that family name. You can't go to the courthouse and change your name with God. You're stuck with it. You're outside of Christ. And only until you receive Christ and repent for your sins, that's when your position changes. But I want to tell you what's happened. And it's no shock to many of you. I believe in some ways the evangelical church has maybe made, maybe made this a little worse. And, and the motive was good. The motives were, were wholehearted. But let me tell you, in the past 30, 40, 50, 60 years, evangelical churches have made it very easy for you to think you're a saved Christian. If you will walk an aisle, go to talk to somebody like John Garner, join the church, be baptized. And we've made, for decades, people think that, well, I've, I've got the contract. But I'm going to say to you, friend, while that may be a part of coming to Christ, you haven't come to Christ at all unless your entire person has been redeemed and your will has been redeemed and the fruits of your life show it. 
and the attitudes and the things you crave and the things you want and the things that matter most to you have shifted, that's when you know that you can love people that you used to never be able to love. That you can forgive people that there's no way you would have forgiven them in times past. There are evidences of salvation. And that's not a contract. But see, a lot of people think they have this contract with God. Well, I joined the church. And I wonder, I really do wonder. I wonder, I wonder how many people are going to stand before God on their judgment day and be shocked. Shocked. Jesus even alludes to that, you know. He said in just a few verses right before the two houses, he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Lord, we cast out demons in your name. Lord, we did wonders in your name. And he will say to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He just said it. I don't know you. See, those are religious people. They were temple goers, church goers, people that went to the men's breakfast every time they had it. They were people that occasionally went on mission trips. And I'm not trying to get you ever in any way to doubt your salvation or question your salvation. I would never do that to you. But what I do want you to hear me say, friend, is that a contract of fire insurance isn't the New Testament idea of a disciple. I'll say it again, the, the contract of fire insurance is not the New Testament idea of a disciple. A disciple is somebody that their whole life has fallen into conformity with the man from Nazareth. And eternal life is based on that position, not just on some contract that you made with the church. No. No. I believe there is one other inescapable reality that we have to deal with based on what Jesus said right here, and it is this, that there is coming judgment, and you cannot escape it. You can't. You, you can't escape it, whether if you want to or not. There is a reckoning coming. It doesn't matter. You know what? It doesn't matter if you believe it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you don't want it to be true. It doesn't matter if you think that's just folklore. It doesn't matter if you choose to receive it or if you don't. It doesn't change the fact that there is coming a day that there is going to be a trumpet blow and the sky is going to split and a man on a horse is going to come and he is going to set everything right. And it doesn't matter if you receive that or believe it at all. It doesn't change the fact that it is true. It is true. There is a reckoning coming. And so you may ask the question, man, where is the love in that? Right? I mean, I, I, I want to tell you guys something. It, it, the gentle, easy Jesus that just eats at parties is way easier for me. And he is all that. But Jesus is also judge. You say, well, but where's this man that loves and he's the BFF of, you know, center people and where is this guy? Where's the love in, in the, where's the love in the you'll know them by their fruits? Where's the love in the depart from me? Jesus said it. I didn't say it. Jesus said depart from me. I never knew you. Where's the love in that? I'll tell you where the love is. I'll tell you where the love is. The love is in the fact that you have a holy God that loves you so much that he's telling you you're going to stand before him. That's where the love is. The love is that you've got a holy God that says, I care about you so much, I don't want you to be duped to think you're okay. There, the, the love is found, I mean, how much love do you have to have for a creation that you made See, this is the heart of the gospel story, that God made us, and we said, I want my own way, and I want to be my own boss. I am the chief executive of my life, and I want my way, and so what did God do? He said, okay, you can have it, but there's no free lunches. You're going to pay for that. 
You see, when, when, when people die and they go to hell when they die, the, the scriptures are very clear that, that, that there is a penalty for rejecting God, and that is a, a life spent in hell for all eternity. And, and so people say, well, that's not loving. A loving God would never do that. And the response to that is, no, no, you did that. You did that. You told God your whole life, I want nothing to do with you. You're not going to have jurisdiction over anything I do. You're not going to, I'm not letting you in. So friends, on judgment day, if that's, if that's one of your friends' posture, maybe it's your posture. If that's your posture, all you're doing is getting what you always wanted. You always wanted God to leave you alone. And he said, okay, I will forever. Forever. And that's why missions month matters so much. It's why the kingdom work at Clearview Baptist Church matters so much. People that die without Christ go to hell because they chose it. And we stand in the gap to say that you must build your house on the foundation. So the love is found in that there is a God that says, even in his own word, it is his desire that none should perish. None. So I want to present you with something this morning. The last thing in the world I would ever want you to do is to scare you about your walk with Christ. But also the last thing in the world I'd ever want to do is make you think you have a walk with Christ when you don't. I want you to know that you know that you are a believer. So we have a graphic up here I want to show to you, and it's, it's a text. There's a phone number, 615-258-6335. And if you'll text Jesus to that number, here's what we're going to do. Our, our connections pastor, John Garner, wonderful man, he's going to contact you. If you're not sure, listen to me, listen to me really clearly. If you are not 100% sure that you could stand before God, if you did not make it home today, you left clear view, Happens every week in America. Somebody's going to leave a church and they're not going to make it home. There's people that go to bed tonight and they die in their sleep. And if that happened to you and you're going to stand in front of your God, is that going to be a hallelujah? Or are you scared about that? And if you are, you text Jesus to 258-6335, area code 615, so that you can come to Christ and know that you're built on the rock. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter. But sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world to sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.